Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. The Department of Justice suing the state of Texas again, this time over the new voting law, saying that some parts of it, quote, disenfranchise eligible Texas citizens who seek to exercise their right to vote, end quote. That new law known as Senate Bill 1 signed into law back in September, putting several changes on the Texas law books, such as banning drive through voting and new rules for voting by mail. The focus of this lawsuit targets two provisions of that new law, one related to assistance in voting booths and another related to the rejection of mail in ballots, saying it would negatively impact voters with disabilities, elderly voters, members of the military who are deployed, voters with limited English proficiency and voters residing outside of the country. After that suit was filed, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton defended the new law, calling it, quote, a great and much needed bill, end quote. He is on trial for killing his wife's grandmother back in 2015. This is R.C. Curtis, charged with the murder of 75-year-old Paula Boy. Jurors hearing testimony today from a San Antonio police detective assigned to this investigation. And as Jaffany Gray reports, today he told jurors what he saw and the evidence that he found that led to Curtis's arrest. I just knew it was an adult female, uh, approximately 75 years old. Witness and lead detective Randall Hines took to the stand on day three of the R.C. Curtis trial. In his testimony, he gave a timeline of what happened when he found 75-year-old Paula Boyd, a beloved ATB employee found naked and murdered inside her Northside apartment on October 21, 2015. Curtis was Boyd's granddaughter's husband. Earlier, the Bear County Medical Examiner went through a long list of injuries Boyd suffered before she was killed, including a severed spinal cord, up to 15 rib fractures, and injuries associated with strangulation and blunt force trauma. After speaking with Boyd's daughter, I got information about a bank account that belonged to Miss Paula Boyd. During his investigation, Hines says he got receipts from a convenience store ATM and surveillance footage showing when Boyd's card had been used and by whom. Blackmail about 6'4", uh, probably over 300 pounds, wearing blue shorts, red tank top, and a ball cap. Does the defendant look like the individual that you saw in the video in the store? I'm going to object that name's the province of the jury. Yes, sir. That's okay. more evidence like bank records was also presented during the trial, even though it was contested by the defense. Again, this trial continues through tomorrow. If convicted, Curtis faces life in prison at the Cadena Reeves Justice Center. Jaffney Gray, case at 12 News. Is summer hesitant? Many parents jumping at the chance to get their younger kids vaccinated against COVID. Just days after the CDC gave the green light to the Pfizer vaccine for kids 5 to 11, University Health began taking appointments and vaccinating children at the Wonderland of the Americas vaccine site. And that's where our Stephanie Jimenez joined us live. It was a busy place at 5. Does not look as if it has slowed down, Steph. Yeah. That's right, Steve, but there is a reason for that, and that is because University Health here is just wrapping up administering its vaccines for the day. It's been pretty busy here. I mean, all you're going to see here right now are just the workers here because all the parents and the families have pretty much left already. But, you know, they're saying that they vaccinated about a thousand children from the ages of five to 11 years old today at this site alone. Now, just a reminder that the younger kids in that age group that I just mentioned, five to 11, they're getting a low dose of the Pfizer vaccine because that's what the CDC is allowing. University Health is taking appointments online and they say that there's been a ton of interest. In fact, they're booked tomorrow and Monday. Parents are telling us that they're relieved. The holidays are just around the corner and now that their kids have their first dose, they can be protected against COVID and see their families. This is the day we've been waiting for. Uh, for our family. We've been waiting for a year for them to come out here. Um, it's important because we want them to interact back in society. We want to make sure that they're safe. We want to make sure that they help uh, our community not spread this virus. But it's important. It's our part in the community to ensure that we're all vaccinated. Everybody in our family is vaccinated. All right, now back out live here. You're going to see these walls right here. This place is super kid friendly. There's art, lollipops, drawings. All of this is to make the kiddos feel more comfortable getting the shots. And by the way, this isn't the only location where those younger kids can come and get their Pfizer vaccines. In fact, we have a list for you on our website, 
ksat.com. And by the way, Steve, I grabbed these lollipops, I mean, excuse me, these stickers. I'm going to bring one back for you, okay? Because I know how much you like these. Aw, that's <laughs> for now, great. Live here, Stephanie Jimenez, KSAT 12 News. Steve, back to you. Big sticker guy, Steve is. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Big step for so many families. Thanks, Stephanie. Many families across Bear County will have some fresh produce just in time for the holiday season, thanks to an urban farm on the east side helping to fight food insecurity. A total of about 18,000 pounds of vegetables and fruits grown here at the Greenies Urban Farm on the east side. It's been donated now for distribution around Bear County. The farm is located at Sherman Road in Hudson Street. It's a collaboration between the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Services and Bear County. The vegetables harvested this year include squash, cucumber, other super greens. An event was held this morning at the farm to welcome its second harvest, and food was donated to partnering organizations with families still struggling because of COVID-19. This food was certainly welcomed. People are having a hard time. This gives them a little bit of a break. And right before Thanksgiving, uh, they may have some great uh, veggies at the table. Throughout this pandemic, we've seen lots of people suffer uh, from food insecurity and many people at all, at all different levels. And food costs have been increasing. So being able to provide them fresh fruits and vegetables from this garden is just a beautiful partnership we've been able to have. The farm also helps people living in areas that do not have easy access to healthy foods, places known as food deserts. Food has been given to the San Antonio Food Bank, the Wheatley Senior Living Apartments, and to families with University Health's CareLink program. It's a great idea. A new at six in a few months, a select group of South Texans will offer their blood for testing in a revolutionary clinical trial that could save the lives of millions. That test detects 50 kinds of cancer in your body, all at once. Ursula Perry with those who are hoping to take on cancer before it takes its toll on anyone else. Anchor and reporter Rosindo Rios' family and her KSAT family were devastated when she died of cancer last year. Some are asking what if she'd caught it earlier through screening? I don't know that I could say it would have saved her life but I think it would have prolonged her life because she could have caught it sooner. In Rosinda's case, years, family history of a similar cancer would have been her first clue. But now the Mayo Clinic has a test that drills down on the issue. Two vials of blood are drawn and sent to a lab, and then 10 days later, you find out. And what the tests do can both detect, one, is there cancer DNA in the bloodstream? And two, and this is very important, where is it potentially coming from? UT Health's MD Anderson Cancer Center is part of the Mayo Clinic's next testing step. It'll soon be looking for patients who qualify for a clinical trial that will be nationwide. In the ideal world, in the setting of a clinical trial, so we can learn best, you know, how to use them, uh, and again, really how to catch cancer in its earliest setting. It's called the gallery test and it's not yet FDA approved and it's also not meant to take the place of regular screenings like mammograms and colonoscopies. If you'd like to get in on the clinical trial in San Antonio, it's not underway yet, but you can still call MD Anderson in San Antonio and get your information in early. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. And this was more than just a casual walk. New at six, the COVID-19 pandemic has been life changing for nearly everyone, but it's taken one San Antonio man on a unique journey. 33 year old Michael Collins said he felt called to take the ultimate 3,800 mile road trip from here to Alaska. He didn't drive, he walked. KSAT digital journalist Julie Moreno talked to him about this once in a lifetime adventure. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, this is amazing. Inspired by shows about the Alaskan frontier and feeling frustrated by restrictions of pandemic living, Michael Collins strapped on a backpack last January and started walking to Alaska. I did not really have much of a plan. I knew that I needed to go northwest. The former soccer player had no experience with backpacking or camping, but he literally so took the journey it. one step at a time. So this is about me and my walk with God, um, and also my craving for um, an adventure that is uh, a bit more primitive and a bit more 
in the other direction than the, today's common adventures. The philosophy uh, led him to right, unexpected I, paths I and generous thing. people. How's it going? If somebody stops by and gives you a turkey leg or a Subway sandwich, it's amazing. So thank you, Jesse. A stranger in New Mexico even welcomed him into her home just as February storms were blowing in. Snowing, about four degrees. I am so thankful that I had a place to stay. It wouldn't be his last battle with Mother Nature. You're beautiful. I'm sorry for bothering you. I and yes, he had encounters with rattlesnakes and bears. And obviously it gets your heart pounding. But it's the mental obstacles that he overcame on the trail that he's most proud of. Looking back on the, on the trip, you know, it was really hard. Um, it was really grueling. It took a lot of endurance. And not only that, I learned about patience and I learned about, you know, self-control. After a ferry ride to Ketchikan, Collins made it to Alaska exactly nine months after he left San Antonio. He's not sure what comes next, but that's okay. And I learned quickly along the way that it was just one step in front of the other. And one of the most valuable experiences that I learned from that journey is just being very present. Julie Moreno, KSAT 12 News. Hey, Collins plans to stay in Ketchikan at least through the winter. He's working the night shift at a homeless shelter where he's been able to use the lessons he's learned to support others on their paths. You can read more about his journey right now on KSAT.com and tune into GMSA on Saturday morning for part two of this story. Collins talks about his biggest lessons he learned from this pandemic experience. 3,800 miles. Wow. Yeah. Let's take a look outside with live cam. It has been gray all day in the 50s. This is the chill before <laughs> the warm up, Adam. And you know, nobody's more chill than Adam Cassidy. Of course. Especially on a Thursday. I was going to say, given the day. Especially on a Thursday. I'm going to take that, given the day, okay? That's the only reason I'm taking that. So the aquifer actually up seven tenths of a foot today. I love seeing this. It's up over a foot since our recent rainfall. So that's nice to see. And by the way, if you haven't already been notified, we are back to year round watering rules. So we are out of stage one and we have been for just a couple of days. Look at the rainfall accumulations across our area. Well over an inch in some spots, including Yoakum, Kerrville, Bernie, Stinson, Elmendorf had over two inches of rainfall. So some healthy accumulations this evening. Nothing really stands out other than the cool temperatures, low clouds hanging in place. It looks like it could rain. It's not going to. We'll be right near 50 at midnight. I'll break down the morning low temperatures all across our area in just a bit and talk about how much we're going to warm up and when in a minute. A new strategy when it comes to tracking the virus that causes COVID-19. Researchers right here in San Antonio now making the virus glow. Tonight on the Night Beat, a look at how it's helping to shed light on the pandemic and save lives. Plus. I'm Lee Waldman coming up tonight on the Night Beat. Varying vaccination rates across the city. We're breaking down the lowest numbers by zip code and asking doctors why there's a disparity. It is a streak the state does not want to continue. Sunday will mark 21 years since the last fatality free day on Texas roads. Our Samuel King joined us now. Samuel TxDOT making a push to end the streak. Well, Steve and Myra TxDOT has invested hundreds of millions of dollars in recent years to reduce traffic deaths. But in the end, they say a lot of it comes down to responsible driver behavior. Speeding, distracted driving, not wearing seatbelts, all factors in a concerning trend. Not only has it been almost 21 years since the last day without a death on Texas roadways, the number of fatalities is higher than it's been in decades. Currently, we got 3,556 fatalities in our state. Last year alone, we had 3,892. That was the highest fatality we count we had in our state since 1984. And TxDOT's Michael Chacon says right now people are dying on Texas roadways at the rate of 11.6 per day. We're on track to see 4,200 fatalities in 2021. We just cannot let that happen. We've got to do all our parts like everyone was saying before me. It's a shared responsibility. TxDOT says its Vision Zero strategy has three pillars, engineering, education, and enforcement. Education is the focus for the next few days. You'll see more of TxDOT's End the Street campaign on social media and on television. You'll notice that the, the name of the campaign, the hashtag, is End the Street Texas. We did this specifically because we wanted all Texans to fill in ownership in this serious issue. We want you to act like the driver you want next to you. 
And as we told you last week, Texas is one of several states getting a special focus from the Federal Highway Safety Administration. And San Antonio will also see more resources in the coming months to help combat pedestrian fatalities. According to TxDOT, 555 pedestrians statewide have been killed so far this year. Again, another increase. As for the evening commute, some good news if you're on I-10 and Presta, that crash that we saw earlier has been cleared, but traffic is still uh, moving kind of slowly uh, in this area this evening. So we'll take a closer look at that. First, just a little bit uh, east of that direction, eight minutes now coming in from Loop 410 to I-37, five minutes uh, the other way. This had been up to 15 minutes, but we're starting to see some of those delays clear. So that's good news, but here's where that crash scene was. It's still on the board, but it's cleared. We can still see uh, some delays heading westbound toward I-10 and I-35 this evening. Taking a wider look, some of our normal spots are getting better, including uh, 35 and 1604, but we do have at least one other crash reported. This is a 1604 at uh, Petrenko. Looks like the main lanes look fine, but we're seeing some delays on Petrenko, as you might expect this, e this time of evening, and also on the frontage roads of 1604. So we'll keep an eye on that throughout the evening, guys. Thank you, Samuel. Look outside with Sky 12, high above the quarry here. It has just been gray all day. This is one of those days you just want to bundle up and Stay inside. You know, you really appreciate how sunny San Antonio is when you get a couple of days where it's not. I know. We start complaining after a day or two. Yeah. Right. But, oh, my goodness. The complaints already from my neighbors today. Yeah. I'm like, oh, it's so cold. It's, I was like, you were just complaining about how hot and humid it was, and now it's too cold. We're a little spoiled. Yeah. We just can't, you know, can't, yeah. it's hard to get that happy. We're not San Diego. And you know what? Personally, I'm glad we're not because then you don't appreciate the days that we have coming to us because when you have them every day, you don't appreciate them. Yeah, 60s tomorrow, 70s this weekend with sunshine. There you go. <laughs> His he, work, just drops the, he drops the clicker. His work here is done. Yep, I, I had to get on my soapbox for a minute there. <laughs> so call me cool tonight. The sun returns tomorrow and temperatures will be rebounding into the pleasant levels for most people. I, I want to point this out and take a look at our almanac today. Today, our high temperature of 56 degrees was the coolest high temperature we've had since February 19th. Whew. Yeah, and that was right when we were pulling out of the winter, the winter chill that we had and the winter snow that we had. So woo -wee, quite a long time since we've had a high temperature that low. Elsewhere today, we had temperatures mainly in the 50s. The average high, by the way, 76 degrees. Elsewhere, we had temperatures mainly in the 50s. Some locations right at 60 for a high. Low clouds kept us cool. 54 right now, dew point of 45 with a north wind at 7. So the wind has definitely calmed down quite a bit, and you're not even going to notice it tonight. Bernie at 50 along with Comfort. 58 Stinson, 54 Converse, 55 Hondo, and by and large, 50s to a few spots in the low 60s. Del Rio at 62 degrees, College Station at 60, but those are the exceptions. So tomorrow morning, we're anticipating low to mid 40s for most of us. 41 in Fredericksburg and Canyon Lake, even Gonzales about 41. Uvalde 46, downtown San Antonio about 46, but in outline areas. So once you get to about 1604, you get outside of 410, and we're going to have some lower 40s. Timberwood Park 41, along with Leon Springs. Stone Oak about 45 degrees. Lake Hills, Myco 41, Lavernia 43. So chilly at the bus stop tomorrow morning. Want to have the jacket. Luckily, no breeze out there. And then by the afternoon, sunny and 60s. Pleasant. We'll gradually break out into the sunshine tomorrow and make it into the mid 60s. By Saturday, we're at 70. Sunday, 75. And next week, we'll be right near 80 degrees. So we're going to be warming up a bit. Here's our overall weather pattern. Low clouds really lingering overhead and across about half the state at the moment. This bump in the flow, that ridge, that's going to work its way overhead. So the big blue H, or not even a big blue H, but an upper level high will be nosing its way in for the next several days. That's why we're anticipating a sunny and dry stretch. So tomorrow, yes, we'll start the day with some low clouds in the low to mid 40s. By the afternoon, we should be sunny back into the 60s. Not much of a breeze out there during the day. It'll be variable just at a few miles per hour. As I mentioned, into the weekend, a lot of sunshine, low to mid 70s for highs, but Saturday morning, still a chill. We'll be low to mid 40s again. And then next week, a little return of humidity. You'll notice it a little bit by Monday, Tuesday. So that'll give us warmer mornings closer to 60 degrees. That weekend looks so good. Thanks, Adam.
All right, I have to admit, last night's game was so close. There was a point where I was like, you know, would Jakob Pertl have meant a difference? And I don't, I don't know. It's hard to say because he had a double-double in the loss at Dallas, 14 right. points, 13 rebounds. But Drew Eubanks said that he didn't play quite as well as Jakob would have played down low. So who knows, right? Yes, the Mavs beat the Spurs, and they lost without Jakob, who is out again tomorrow night. Plus, Hondo will visit Carrizo Springs tomorrow in a huge BGC matchup coming up. There's no setbacks in uh, the hamstring. He, he's been just fine. And hopefully he's that way today and tomorrow. He's healthy, and he's our starting quarterback. You heard it. Tyrod Taylor is back. Per Texas head coach David Coley in Big Board Sports. For the second time in less than a week, the Dallas Mavericks beat the Spurs, this time at the AT&T Center, 109-108. A week ago tonight, the Mavs beat them in Dallas, 104-99. Last night's game saw eight ties and 11 lead changes. The Spurs' largest lead was 10, while the Mavs was 12. DeJounte Murray led the Spurs with 23 points. Center Jakob Pertl missed the game due to health and safety protocols. Drew Eubank started in his place and ended up with 10 points and five rebounds in 19 minutes. Yak does obviously has done a lot for us and we're going to miss him out there. But me personally, I just got to be more solid, especially on defense. Um, made some adjustments in the second half and, and got it going a little bit, but just overall being more solid. It's a next man up mentality. Uh, you know, I always said that. And <laughs> we got, you know, some guys here who been working, you know, uh, you got a guy like that as a vet, Drew and Jock, guys up and coming, just, you know, working, waiting their turn. And, you know, that's why I try to preach tonight. Uh, you know, we hope y'all gets well and get back soon. Uh, but in the NBA, it's just next man up mentality. Mavs guard Jalen Brunson did in the Spurs for the second time this season, scoring 13 of his game high 31 points in the fourth quarter to help the Mavs win. So the Spurs will play at the Magic tomorrow night at 6 to close out the two game regular season series. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Tyrod Taylor will be back in shotgun formation for the Houston Texans Sunday when they visit the Dolphins. He last played in week two at Cleveland, suffering a hamstring injury in the second quarter that knocked him out of the game. The start of a seven game losing streak for the Texans. Head coach David Coley was asked what Taylor did well during his nearly six quarters of play to start the season. Well, he did what a veteran quarterback's supposed to do. You know, he executed our offense. He he ran it well. Um, uh, he distributed the ball around. Um, uh, we were able to run the ball because of his ability to be able to, to run. And uh, he got a bunch of off-schedule stuff for us. And uh, hopefully the those same things start to happen. Miami will host Houston Sunday at noon. Both teams are 1-7. and seven. The BGC road trip tomorrow night will feature the Hondo Owls at the Carrizo Springs Wildcats. Carrizo Springs is 9-0 overall, 4-0 in District, 15-4-A-2, good for first place. Hondo sits third and forward, 4-3-1 four and three and one in District. A win will lock up the Wildcats' first district title since 1997. Hondo won district last season, and they want to at least keep a share of it this season. Hondo's a team that uh, comes with uh, with uh, with a work ethic that has been instilled in them for a long period of time, and so they're going to definitely be fired up and ready to go. And so we just got to stay focused and uh, keep our keep our composure together and get after it. Watching them on film, they're they're very well coached. Um, they do a great job with with what they do, and um, <clears throat> they're they're going to be very excited tomorrow. So we've got to we've got to be ready to go and, and match their excitement and enthusiasm, and it should be a great game. Kick is tomorrow night at 730. Hondo has won eight straight against Carrizo Springs dating back to 2012. That will be a game to watch. It will indeed. And we'll be there. All right. Thanks, Larry. Our KSAT Q&A with Dr. Ruth Berggren up next. 
You saw the crowd of parents and local children eager to get that COVID-19 vaccine for kids ages 5 to 11. The CDC signing off on that. But there are certainly still some questions that parents have. So to help us answer those, we have Dr. Ruth Bergren, the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio, an infectious disease specialist who we have leaned on for nearly two years now. So thanks so much for your time here. Let's talk about what this study actually showed with kids in that age group getting the vaccine. What kind of protection did they have from COVID-19? So first of all, we had about 3,000 kids actually get get the, the vaccine, and they developed really robust antibody levels comparable to what adults got. And here's the really important point. There was 90% protection from symptomatic COVID disease. So that's, that's not just COVID, that's anything, correct? I mean, that, that's related to COVID. Yes, COVID's 90% protection against COVID symptoms. So this is very, very potent, and this is really great news. I want to talk about side effects. That seems to be one of the concerns that we're hearing from parents is what kind of side effects will be involved with children. And that has a couple of things. Obviously, parents concerned that their kids may get sick, but also concerned that their kids may get sick and they can't take time off to take care of them. So do you have some studies on what the side effects may be and maybe some advice for some of these parents? Sure. Well, this was studied by Pfizer and we have data from over 3000 kids and the most common side effect is going to be pain in the arm. That's not too surprising. After that headache, maybe in about 40%, mostly that's mild and only 7% get fever after the second dose. And that's what parents are most concerned about because they're worried that if their kids get vaccinated, that they're going to wind up missing school. If the kids have to miss school because of a fever, then the parents will miss work. And that's a really important consideration. I know why parents are so concerned about this. But the good news is that in the younger children, the 5 to 11 age group, which is what we're talking about today, um, only 6.5 to 7% developed a fever, it was mostly mild fever, following the second vaccination. So that means you've got a really good chance, 93% chance your kid won't even have a fever. Um, but if you're worried, if you're still worried that the child will be ha have a reaction that causes them to miss school and then causes you to miss work, you could think about this strategy, which is to schedule the vaccination for your child on a Thursday afternoon or Friday, since most kids aren't gonna have any kind of fever um, for at least a day or so, that way they're gonna be okay going to school and then you have the weekend to deal with any side effects and they're all gone within 48 hours. A lot of parents who are planning to get their kids vaccinated certainly will find that strategy helpful. I know there are others who have questions about whether this is the right decision for, for their child. So myocarditis, that's a concern that we saw in rare cases, a very small number of kids a, over 12 who were already able to get vaccinated. So what can you tell us about that issue? Right. So the first thing to note is that amongst the 5 to 11 year olds in the Pfizer study, there were no cases of myocarditis. Um, however, if we look at the 12 to 17 year old uh, age category, young males uh, did have a uh, reported incidence of myocarditis, inflammation of the heart muscle of about one in 15,000. That's one in 15,000 for the highest risk group. Other groups had much lower risk. Now, the thing to compare to is the risk of heart muscle inflammation from COVID. And that was about one in 50. One to two percent of healthy young adults who get COVID will have evidence of myocarditis. So there's actually less risk of myocarditis from the vaccine than there is from the virus, and you could argue that the vaccine would prevent myocarditis, which is a good thing. We continue to hear the rumors that this will affect fertility when it comes to kids. It's the same rumors we heard about adults. Is there any evidence that that's true? 
No, no, no evidence that there's any impact on fertility whatsoever. Uh, we have no reason to be concerned about this. There was no evidence of reduction of fertility in any adult who's gotten the COVID vaccine, and we don't anticipate anything for children either. There's no basis for this rumor. Before we let you go here, I'm just curious what your what your thought is on getting kids vaccinated. What will that do for this entire pandemic, what we've been dealing with for the better part of two years? Well, I, I would like to think that it's going to make Christmas vacation a lot safer and happier for a lot of people. If you get vaccinated by your first vaccine by the 20th of November, you can get fully protected by Christmas um, and I think that with 300,000 uh, children in San Antonio alone um, uh, eligible for this vaccine, once we get them vaccinated, we're really going to start to get closer to that herd immunity goal of 90 percent protection that all of us are hoping for. Yeah, and that's what some parents that we talked to at Wonderland of America's Mall said they want their kids fully vaccinated by Christmas. It is certainly possible. And doctor, it sounds like you've got a, a little friend there that wants your attention. So we're going to let you go. Dr. Ruth Bergeron with the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Always a pleasure. We get more people vaccinated. We can do more in-person interviews. Let the animals have their space. That would be great. <laughs> we'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. There's some reminders about some construction. We've been seeing uh, this uh, for a while here. This project that Loop 1604 in the northwest side. So some more alternating lane closures along a large stretch of the road, including between I-10 and Bandera Road, starting at 9. This latest round runs through November 6th probably be extending that as well. Looking at some other parts of the area here in uh, Comal County, there'll be some lane work tonight at, at 9 o'clock. Also, FM 306 to the uh, South Guadalupe River, so watch out uh, for that this morning. In terms of crashes, we do have one on the board here. This is Loop 410 at Lakeside Parkway on the west side, so uh, just uh, north of uh, Marbog approaching uh, 151. So watch out for that too. Traffic down to 17 miles per hour in that area. But looking at Transguide I-10 at Pressa, still looking good this evening, folks. Thank you, Samuel. Look outside right now. There are those who love this weather and those who don't. They, I, they may be happy with what's to go. I don't mind the temperature. It's just that it's so gray. Yeah, I mean, it's literally like a blanket of clouds out there. That's exactly what it is. And it is kind of a, you know, kind of ruins your mood sometimes, you know, if you have these prolonged cloudy days. But we're going to be sunny again tomorrow. So bright and sunny by tomorrow afternoon. 54 right now with the low clouds. They're going to linger through the night. So temperatures just falling off a little bit, and we'll start the day tomorrow in the 40s. I'll talk about low temperatures for all across our area. You'll want the jacket in the morning, that's for sure. But not forever. We'll break it all down for you coming up. All right, it is cold outside, gray. Mm -hmm. It's all about to change, but you know what? We'll make today even brighter. What? It's Thermometer Thursday. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, is it? Yes, it is. And it's perfect <laughs> weather, perfect time of year to have a homemade thermometer to measure all those changes outside. And this one right here. When is it a good time of year to have a good thermometer? Oh, it's a great time of year, no matter yeah. what. I okay. Mean, 365 days. Even leap year day, whatever. It's all perfect. <laughs> so today we or today we were only in the mid 50s for highs. It's tomorrow back into the 60s with sunshine. Saturday and Sunday we're in the 70s. Then next week we get a little bit closer to 80 degrees. So we're going to notice some warmer temperatures on the way. Take a look at our satellite today. We had the low clouds lingering. Of course, they disappear toward the final frame because the sun is setting earlier now. And uh, the visible satellites really just a high powered camera in outer space. It's not the infrared imagery. It's just pictures throughout the day. So that's why they disappear at night. Anyway, you see those low clouds really holding tight across our area and it affected temperatures. We had a high temperature of 61 in Lubbock and 65 in Amarillo. That's where we had some sunshine, but locally we topped out at 56 degrees. And I said earlier in the newscast, that's the coldest high temperature we've had since February 19th. Been a while. Now is when we were pulling out of our winter freeze. Uh, right now we're 62 Marfa, 62 Del Rio, 
So a few areas in the lower 60s, Brownsville 62, but uh, 55 in Carrizo Springs, Kerrville 51 and Fredericksburg now down to 49. So already starting to see some 40s out there. And this is what we're expecting tomorrow morning. Lower 40s north of Highway 90. So Canyon Lake, Austin 41, Kerrville right near 40 degrees. Some nooks and crannies of the hill country could dip into the upper 30s. But elsewhere, we're generally in the mid 40s. That is downtown San Antonio and within 410. You get outside of 410 and I'm expecting some lower 40s. Elmendorf, La Soya, 43 along with Castroville. 41 Timberwood Park in Leon Springs. 41 the temperature tomorrow morning in Bernie. We'll even trim off a few more degrees into Saturday. But by Sunday and into next week, our morning temperatures rise. We're not going to have that jacket weather. You'll you'll want the jackets the next couple of mornings. But once we get into Monday, and especially Tuesday time frame, we're back to 60 degrees with a hint of humidity in the air for the morning temperatures right near sunrise. There's a lack of mugginess in the air, of course, drier air, even Corpus Christi, a dew point of only 52. I say only because they're right on the coast and usually They've got one of the highest dew points with due to the proximity to the Gulf of Mexico, but the humidity is not going to be notice, noticeable until just a hint of it early next week. And dew points back near and in the lower 60s by about Tuesday. Here's the pattern. Big dip in the upper level flow, pushed the cold front through, caused some rain. That's all over the Gulf of Mexico. Upper level high, blue H over the Baja Peninsula, bump in the upper level flow. That ridge is going to arc its way overhead the next several days, so we're looking at Nothing but sunshine, not first thing in the morning. I still think we'll have a decent amount of clouds to start the day, but by the afternoon we'll have a lot of sunshine and a dry stretch of weather from the 40s in the morning tomorrow to the 60s in the afternoon. Saturday we start the day in the 40s, so early risers going for that bike ride, long jog or jogger walking the dog Saturday morning 40s and a bit cool below average, but the afternoons will be comfortable in the 70s, the near 80 as we get into next week. No, Myra and Steve, this is not a banjo or a ukulele as much as it looks like one. This is a beautiful instrument cluster. Okay, we've got the, herp the hygrometer, the barometer, and then what used to be a thermometer. My new pal Ken swung by the, uh, the other day to drop this off and have me take a look at it. This was um, basically what he and his wife inherited from his father-in-law, in England when he retired from the company he worked for. I think it was called Barry or Bury, B-U-R-I. And um, that was back in like the late 70s. And they brought this back over to the States here. And unfortunately, when these travel, they often break. And so what I'm gonna do is over the coming weeks, just replace all of this, do my best. I've done this before, you may have remembered. I'm gonna try to replace all of this, put a whole new scale that matches the color, and of course make a homemade thermometer rather than uh, this one right here, but make one to replace it. So hopefully get this instrument cluster back um, up to our standards around here. And I, I'm also gonna uh, calibrate this barometer. A lot of people think that their barometers are broken. They just need to be calibrated. And we can go over that. It's a very simple turn of a dial on the back. We'll, we'll go over that another day. Not a ukulele, but a yeah. fantastic <laughs> and ornate instrument cluster. That's a beautiful cluster. It is. Yes, it is. And actually, I've found that the ones from England are often the most ornate. Hmm. By the way, we do have a winner. It's not popping up. Oh, here we go. It's popping up in outer space ahead of us. Janet Uller or Euler of San Antonio. I sent you the email a little while ago, Janet. So too bad, Janet. Too bad Janet didn't already have her that case at the monitor, then she would have known it's the coldest day since winter storm Uri. No, we don't call them by those names, Steve. No, no, no. That is a marketing gimmick by the Weather Channel. And no, we don't call them by those names. I, I this know, is already I just, broken, so there's I can only bring, one I can reason. Bring it there's over only there, one, Steve. There's only one, maybe two reasons I brought that up. Yes. I know it irritates to you. Push and, a giant and button. Some, somebody dared me to. Yeah, and he also won one whole dollar. <laughs> In case you missed it, coming up next. Give me my soapbox. <laughs> Good morning to you. It is Thursday, November 4th. Firefighters arrived to flames through the roof on the back side of that structure. A woman in her 40s was taken to the hospital with significant burns. Firefighters say they were able to put out that fire pretty quickly. First and five, we have a breaking news update on the suspect charged in the shooting at the Quarry Market. We've learned 18 year old Julio Cesar Rivera is actually facing new charges in relation to a robbery last month. 
San Antonio police say that back on October 19th, Rivetta robbed a woman and her five-year-old daughter at gunpoint outside of a convenience store in the 5500 block of Highway 87 East. Live at the Wonderland of the Americas Mall, Stephania, I can hear the activity behind you. It sounds like it's pretty busy so far. Yeah, it sounds like it's busy because it really is. Even at this hour, I'll step out of the way so that you can get a clear view of what's happening right here. You've got a lot of families, a lot of parents here getting their kids vaccinated. Also, people are coming here to get their booster shots. University Health is vaccinating 1,100 people a day here. Also learned the name of a man killed in a train crash this week. He is Joe Frank Watkins. He died Monday afternoon after San Antonio police say he was walking along train tracks. This was near Gibbs Sprawl and Miller Road on the northeast side. Despite emergency crews trying life-saving measures, Watkins died at the scene. In hospitality up in here because Ludacris <laughs> is coming to concert, the Alamo City, uh, for the San Antonio Stock Show Rodeo. Just announced that Ludacris and three other acts were going to be joining the already, um, you know, pretty full rodeo lineup. <laughs>watching a slowdown on the west side. This is Loop 410 at Lakeside Parkway uh, northbound down to 17 miles per hour there, but things otherwise looking fine on Loop 410, but that little slowdown there cause you eight minutes to get from Ray Ellison to 151. And this is a look at 1604 Ford Valley Meadow getting close to 151. You can see a little bit of a delay there, Steve. Thank you, Sam. That does it for the six o'clock news. We'll see you back here on the night beat at 10.